So 13 candidates, a process almost guaranteed to mean at least half a dozen ballots, and likely very little convention floor drama. What should we make of all that? The Conservative Leadership Convention this weekend. The insiders are here to help. Jamie Watt is a Conservative strategist. Kathleen Monk is with the NDP. She's in Ottawa tonight. And David Hurley of the Liberals is here with Jamie in Toronto. Their thoughts in a moment, but first, here are some basics. The convention is in Toronto, but almost all the voting will take place across the country. There are more than a quarter of a million eligible to vote, probably around half will. Fourteen names are on the ballot, but one, Kevin O'Leary, has dropped out. Friday night is for speeches. Saturday, the winner is declared. Delegates have been voting for a couple of weeks already, listing their first, second, and so on choices. Voting stops Saturday at 4 p.m. Toronto time, and then the party will drag out announcing the results starting at 5 p.m. Will this be exciting? Could we be surprised? Let's find out. Well, I said just the basics, and those are just the basics. There's one other element, there's 338 ridings, 100 points per riding. You get the number of points your vote in each riding uh, breaks down to on percentage terms, and you add them all up, and whoever has more than half the total number of points, which are in the hundreds of thousands, uh, ends up winning. Having said all that, it's a different process, and, you know, they're experimenting, I, I, I guess, on, on some level. Is this... You know, is it a good process or a bad process, Gene? I think it's a crazy process, Peter. I mean, political parties, especially in opposition, have very few chances to connect in a meaningful way with Canadians. They've designed this process to tune everybody out and have them getting on with their summer. You know, it, it, people say it's more efficient. Well, the last time the Conservative Party did this was 13 years ago. I don't think they need to worry about efficiency. The second thing they've, they've tossed away is the ability of any of the candidates to connect with voters. When we did the Jim Flaherty's first leadership campaign, which he lost, his speech raised his, his uh, vote total 17 points. In the, in the last NDP convention, when we saw Nathan Cullen speak, you know, he didn't get the benefit of that terrific speech. So I think this is for the birds. And he's the Conservative on the panel. Uh, <laughs> Kathleen, what do you make of it? I have to agree with Jamie. I think it really, the, the way they've set up the convention and the voting process, it really denies members the chance to kind of, once they perhaps lose their first choice, the ability to rally behind um, a second candidate and to have that drama on the floor and to see how the collective mind of the convention works and moves towards the second candidate. So I think it, it basically sets up a situation where they're going to have hashtag fake drama at the convention, right? Because they'll actually know the results. Basically, they could have them... Uh, you know, re released Saturday morning, but they're holding on to them to kind of create this fake sense of drama that doesn't really exist. Hashtag fake drama. <laughs> she's, she's ready for the weekend. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's a hashtag fail, as I recall. Yeah, but, uh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I agree with them completely, but I'll, since, and, and for the reasons that they've articulated, but so since that's been well uh, covered territory, I'll say a positive side of it is that second and subsequent ballots at conventions are very chaotic things and people have to make up their minds in a big hurry about what they're going to do when their candidate drops off the ballot and so well, you could argue that, that chance here could argue that this uh, allows them to think of who their second and third choices are in a more deliberative reflective way ahead of time ahead of time uh, rather than in that melee where you're caught up in emotion and but we love that, that melee I know. That's mm -hmm. what makes them dramatic. I know. For all excited. of us who are in politics, that's the whole thing. Yeah. He's being pretty generous. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Um, he, he was searching mm. for a positive, and there, there it is. Uh, in the end, the winner will be declared with whoever's got more than 50% uh, of the accumulated vote. So at the moment, the lead is said to be uh, Maxime Bernier. Um, so when you look at that first ballot result, nobody expects him to have it on the first ballot. What does he have to have to be taken seriously in, in, in the ballots that follow? Jamie? Mm. Uh, one of these, uh, the rules of these things, of course, is if they were, people were voting in a convention would be momentum, right? So he would have to achieve a number bigger than what people expected. So this would be, you know, he'd have to be sizably ahead. Uh, given that that's not the case and we're just going to be reading the tea leaves of what 
votes that have already been cast. And it reminds me a bit of a bicycle race. You know, where's the pack? Where's the peloton? Who makes up each part of those things? And I think, for example, if he doesn't do better than people expect, I think he's going to have a tough day. I'd watch for um, Lisa Raitt to do better than people expect. I'd watch uh, for Aaron O'Toole. I think his message is in the latter part of the campaign has got some traction. And I think he might surprise as well. If those two things happen, even though the votes are already, already cast, be a bit like a canary in a coal mine predicting what's going to come next. Does anybody mm -hmm. want to give me a number of what he needs? I mean, I like I will. that strategy. Uh, oh, Kathleen? I mean, I, I think there's a couple things. I think you're right that we, we assume that Bernier is the front runner because of the fact that O'Leary backed him. But we really don't know because no one's polling in the way that how this vote is being tabulated with 100 points per riding. So mm -hmm. we really have no idea. That said, I think we have to see Bernier uh, with more than 25 percent, closer to maybe 30 on the first, first ballot to really think that he's going to have a clear path. Conversely, people like O'Toole and Shear, the, the closest uh, to the front runners, really need to be above 15 percent. So, you know, we'll know uh, then if, if they will have a chance of kind of usurping Bernier's supposed lead. David? Yeah, I don't, I don't know that I can come up with a number because, as Kathleen said, nobody really knows what's going on inside this thing. And I haven't run into many conservatives that even claim to know what's going on inside this thing. I know, for instance, that if a front runner showed up at a convention with 25% on the first ballot, they're probably finished. Right? Mm -hmm. Because the convention turns on them, yes. they have underachieved, and everything galvanizes against them. They don't have to face that here. So he could get 25% and still win. I'm probably going to be trying to read the entrails of underlying data, like, did he do as well in Quebec as people expected him to do right. on the first ballot? Right? What is the gap between him and Scheer or O'Toole, whoever is second based on prognostications? Um, and try to figure out things from that. Is he underperforming or overperforming in ways we can actually measure based on our anticipation? But I don't think the normal rules apply about a front runner because I think normally he wouldn't even really be considered a front runner in this race. You know, a, a wise old man of conservative politics, uh, both current and past uh, progressive conservative politics, sent me a message this week saying, saying, beware the Joe Clark syndrome, coming out of absolutely nowhere. Uh, the, you could win this and remember the big newspaper headline the next day, Joe who. Um, is that a possibility this week? Yeah, well, Peter, I think if you look at who makes up the field, uh, none of them are very well known. Mr. Well, Bernier... There's a lot of Joe Hoos. There's a lot of Joe Hoos. They're all Joe Mr. Bernier is not known out of Quebec. Uh, Ms. Leach is known for all the, wrong, uh, all the wrong reasons. The rest of them you couldn't pick out of a police lineup. So whoever wins is going to be shaking a lot of hands. A lot of talk about the Joe who issue, but there's also the Flora syndrome, right? Well, we remember mm -hmm. Flora McDonald went in we, in great shape, but everybody went lots into that... Lots of buttons, no votes. Lots of buttons, but no votes. Right. Yeah. And so I think that's also possible to have. I think Bernier's real trick is he's got to do really well in Quebec and a couple other places that it's his. If not, I think anything's open to see what happens. Kathleen, um, when you look at this race unfolding by the... Uh, not your party, but another party that you will have to run against in some form in the next mm -hmm. election. Is this a race about individuals, about people, or is it a, pay, a, a race about ideology? Do you, see, do you see that shaping up here? Yeah, amongst the front runners, I don't really see uh, a real ideological uh, race being put forward. Um, if there was one, you could kind of almost call it Harper Light or Harper with a smile or Harper with a sweater vest redo, you know, and that would be the kind of Bernier, Shear O'Toole. Um, uh, you know, while Shear is more of, um, Andrew Shear is more of the SOCON in terms of the top runners uh, he, on abortion, gay marriage, etc., he has really embraced a lot of Harper's policies and, and will manage caucus likely in that way. Um, O'Toole, while strong on public safety issues, um, isn't really seen as a SOCON. Uh, Bernier is the interesting character because he really is a libertarian. He, he really disagrees with basically 50 percent of what a federal government normally does. So it'll be interesting to see, because he doesn't have the caucus support that O'Toole does or, or Scheer does, how he manages the caucus and actually presents a platform in the coming campaign if he wins. Any disagreement on that? No, I don't think it has anything to do with ideology. None of the standard bearers of the Reform Party or the PC's wing uh, contested this race. The leading contender is neither one of those mm -hmm. uh, factions. And I've never seen a leadership race that was decided over ideology anyway. Major parties select their leaders on the basis of who they think is most likely to win, win. the general election. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 100%. the litmus test is Trudeau. Who can beat Trudeau? That's right. That's, that's, yeah. that's the question. I mean, 
you know, delegates of mine. We've all been at and watched and covered leadership conventions of all parties in the past, and and so often what happens in the days after, the parties split. It's divided. There are factions, and they fight against each other, and they never seem to get together. What are the odds of uh, of this party leaving this convention in Toronto this weekend, whatever they decide, of leaving it united? David, pretty good. Pretty good, actually. Uh, this not, doesn't appear to me to have uh, been a very divisive uh, race, with the possible exception of Ms. Leach's uh, interventions um, in the race. Uh, I don't sense that there's a big anti-Bernier, anybody but Bernier movement out there. So if he were to if he were to win, I, I don't know that the party's going to be repulsed by that. Um, and uh, so I mean, I just don't see some of the major schisms. Uh, Cretchen Martin, uh, Turner Cretchen, a Mulroney Clark, epic sort of division in the party that you that creates those kinds of divisions. Jamie, I think you know Peter. One of the things that's been debated in this leadership contest is, do we want to continue with Stephen Harper's approach or do we want something new? Do we want something in the, in the middle? One thing I think all. Everybody agrees on that Stephen Harper got right is conservatives win when they're united and when they lose Will they lose when they're not united and the liberals will win ten times in ten if there's a schism in the party So I think that will trump any temp pardon the expression uh, any, uh, I try to get that, 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 to get that really out of my vocabulary. I know it's like swearing um, yeah. I think that will be more important than any short-term divisions that that exist you have the last word Kathleen yeah I just add that the, whoever wins on Saturday is inheriting a party that's in really good shape they have a strong large caucus of a hundred approximately a hundred uh, MPs they have the best fundraising numbers in the last quarter they have over 250 uh, thousand memberships the highest rate out of all of the parties currently so it's a pretty uh, great title if you get to have it and so I think the party as David and, and Jamie have both said will be united going forward Although there are still, you know, headwinds and some challenges that if a Bernier does win, how he keeps the rural caucus on side because of his, his how he approaches the supply management issue. Well, they'll leave, they'll leave United. Whether they yeah. stay United is a different right. matter. And Good I think point. one of the, yes, one of the interesting right. things yeah. about Mr. Bernier is not just that he's ideological, but he appears to be rigidly ideological. So I don't know um, whether he's really well suited to leading a big tent party. Right. And, and don't forget, uh, Peter, that uh, they're following Ron Ambrose, who's done a terrific job right. of keeping that place together uh, mm -hmm. during this whole process. And a lot of people wish he was on the ballot. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> all right. Thank you all. Good to talk. We'll, uh, we'll assess it all next week. CBC News will have all the action from the Conservative Leadership Convention. Rosemary Barton will join us along with that issue and our main analysts, Peter McKay, Michelle Rempel and Kevin O'Leary. They'll all be part of our live coverage this Friday and Saturday on CBC News Network, CBC Television and online.